Oh, re related to that last song we sang, I have a recurring dream. I was telling Sue about this the other day. Uh, and so I get to heaven and I fall at his feet and he says, stand up, look at me. I said, no, I can't, I can't. And uh, takes three or four exhortations and finally when I stand and look at him, it's like a baptism of love and everything that I thought that I didn't measure up to just disappears. You know, I think that our problem is we have never really comprehended who we are in Christ. You know, Kenneth Hagin, the one that went to be with the Lord in 2003, used to <laughs> exhort us, and I've done it. I've done it several times. In fact, I've got the file on my, uh, in, in, a, in a word format. I can print it and read it any time, but to look up every time in the New Testament, it says, in Christ or in him or in whom. And, uh, but I, I think it's, it's kind of a hard thing to understand. Now, the reason this is on my mind because it relates to where we're headed in the message this evening. And I think it directly comes into play with our trouble of receiving because heh, as much as I have worked at renewing my mind, there's still this old lousy seed of Adam that says you don't deserve it. And uh, we have to get past that some way, somehow. Amen? Amen? I mean, if your child came to you for help and they, they hung their head and they said they didn't deserve you helping to make a car payment or whatever, you'd think something was wrong with them, right? But uh, I think that's kind of our problem. So, uh, gentlemen, don't miss the Power Lunch March 2. We're going to be talking about the battle in the mind. It's not just the mouth that is the enemy of faith, it's the mind. And then also the Holy Week Revival comes early this year, March 24 to 29. And uh, I'm giving you these three scriptures to meditate on getting ready for the Holy Week Revival 2024. John 15, 7. I like the new King James here. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. And the, the reason to meditate on this is that last phrase, and it shall be done for you. Not might, maybe, could be, Probably, no, it shall be done for you. And I think we have to meditate on certain verses. How do you meditate on them? Well, you, you begin by memorizing them. And then what I do is, as I'm going to sleep or trying to go to sleep, I'll just rehearse the same verse over and over and over and over. And I'm not exactly sure how our minds work, but I know, I used to do this with math problems, you know, uh, I'd go to bed thinking about something, and in the morning I had the answer. So, or how to do this or how to do that. And so how, how to pay something off earlier or whatever. And then you wake up in the morning, you have the answer. So I'm not exactly sure how our minds work, but I do know that, I mean, we've all seen a scary movie, right, and had trouble sleeping. So we try and sleep, but our mind's still working. Well, why not put the mind to work on something profitable? Amen. And then the second verse is Mark eleven twenty four. Therefore, I say unto you, what things serve you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. And again, it's that last clause that to me is something we have to re renew our mind to, and you shall have them. There's no uncertainty in that at all. And then 1 John 5, 14, 15, and this, these are the two verses I've been meditating on since mid-January. This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, you know, why don't you, do, why don't you say whatever we ask and throw your hands up? Like, you know, it's shocking. Whatever we ask, I mean, it is shocking, isn't it? We know that we have. We know that we have. See, I, I, I'm still working on this. I've been working on this for a month. We know that we have what we ask of him. We know because, you know, the devil's cruel. 
I mean, he's cruel. You understand the whole operation of the devil? You understand this? He hates God. And, and he can't touch God. He can't do anything to God. He can't hurt God. So he goes after what God loves. That's how cruel he is. And so he's always trying to talk us out of what belongs to us. Amen. I don't believe there's been a man since Jesus that understood who he was in Christ and walked in it fully. I don't believe there's ever been a man. And uh, that would be a high bar. You know, sometimes I feel like if I could just get 10% there, I'd be a major accomplishment or 15% there. But I, I, wanna, I want to get this in my mind and in my heart, not just in my heart, but in my mind, not just in my mind, but in my heart. This is the confidence. So, and we're, we're in this series on faith and prayer. So we need to meditate on the verses we need to meditate on so that when we approach God, we approach God in confidence. That it's not luck or chance or maybe or 5% or 10% or 15%. This is the confidence we have in approaching God that if we ask anything according to his will and... Uh, so that comes into play, the will of God. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we ask of him. Now, last week we mentioned how Jesus prayed in the garden, Father, if it be thy will. And we asked the question, are we to take that as the pattern for every prayer? And the answer is certainly not. But you understand, when you, Faith Christian Center has a culture. And so we get used to it. But when you understand, when you are in Christian circles away from this tribe, it's very common in evangelical Christendom for people to end every prayer, if it be thy will. You know, they pray about healing a child or whatever, if it be thy will. Is that appropriate? Well, that prayer that Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane is what is called a prayer of consecration. And there are different prayers. We're going to deal with this in the Holy Week Revival. There are different prayers in the New Testament and they are governed by different rules. So, I mean, just think of the mayhem if they played a football game but played by baseball rules. I mean, it would everybody would be confused. And so certain rules apply to certain prayers. So when Sue and I were invited in 1982 for me to go and be a guest lecturer for a year at the East Africa School of Theology in Nairobi, the obvious prayer to pray was, Father, is that what you want us to do? If that's what you want us to do, we'll do it. That's a prayer of consecration. Well, the rules are different, though. That's not a prayer of faith. That's not a prayer of agreement. And so it's not appropriate to use those words, if it be thy will, in every prayer. All right, now, it's the heart of every true follower of Christ to not want to do our own will, but want to do his will. Now, we understand this, and we know a lot of his will. So, are we supposed to pray, if it be thy will, on things we know his will on? I mean, we know that saving lost men is his will. We know that carrying the gospel to the world is his will. We know that teaching and building up the believer is his will. I mean, it'd just be stupid, wouldn't it? For me, uh, at uh, 10 to 6, when I was getting ready to come over here, say, stop in the garage and say, Father, is it your will that I go to church and teach the word of God? I mean, that'd just be stupid. So we know his will on a whole lot of things. We know a hundred things that are his will. It is his will that our bills should be paid, that we should be strong and vigorous in our walk with Christ, that we should have a testimony that would lead people to trust in him. So the man who lives and walks in him will never pray outside his will. See, people get all concerned about his will. Again, this verse I gave you to meditate on, getting ready for the Holy Week revival, Jesus said in John 15, 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. 
And the Greek word there means to abide in, to settle down in, to take up residence in. So it's not like a visit. It's not like passing through. It's not like a cursory visit. In other words, to get in and stay in and live in. So I love to meditate on how Jesus did the Father's will, how Jesus taught the Father's will, and how then he did something that we would never be called upon to do. He suffered his Father's will in his substitutionary work. It was all about his Father's will. We mentioned last Wednesday that four times in the Gospel of John, he said, he talked about doing his Father's will, that he had come to do his Father's will. Well, it's in the Pauline Revelation that the Spirit reveals the Father's will to us. We find out what the Father wants. Jesus, you see, was the will of God revealed. He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. One of the heresies today is that Jesus is the new God and the God of the Old Testament is the old God. Nothing can be further from the truth. Jesus said, he that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And so you can go into the Old Testament and find judgment, but you can also go into the book of Revelation and find judgment. See, people think that there was this bad old God in the Old Testament, then sweet Jesus came along and everybody gets a free pass. That's not the way it works. And uh, so judgment is coming. When Jesus would go into the synagogue, he would preach from the book of Isaiah, the spirit of the Lord is upon me to, to heal the sick, to open the blind eyes, uh, to proclaim the year of the Lord's good favor. And he stopped. But that's not what Isaiah says. Isaiah says to proclaim the year of the Lord's good favor and, and then the judgment of God. But Jesus didn't talk about the judgment of God because there's a gap. And we know that gap to be about 2,000 years. There's a gap. Judgment's coming. But just because we're living in the gap doesn't mean judgment's not coming. I mean, you don't think all these people doing all this nefarious stuff are going to get away with it, do you? And you don't think the Lord's just going to let this go on, do you? No. So judgment is ahead. And, uh, and then uh, coming at the head of the army at the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is, has got to be 1,007 years from now, uh, who's going to be at the head of the army? This is a military operation. Who's going to be at the head of the army? The Son of God. And, and on him is written the Word of God. And uh, basically nobody survives. So that's not exactly sweet Jesus from the manger. You understand? See, the world 2,000 years ago, the, 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 one of the reasons the Pharisees rejected him was they were expecting a military leader to overthrow the Roman Empire. Although there's nothing in the scriptures that would give you an indication of that. But that's what, the, because that's what they needed. That's what they wanted. So that's what they saw. See, they were prejudiced by their current events. So they were expecting a military leader. This generation is expecting a baby in a manger, but they're going to get a military leader. So... You know, the whole world zigged when they should have zagged, and now they're zagging when they should have zigged. But uh, it's, it's the same thing. Jesus said, he that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And so when you see Jesus uh, move in compassion, that's the Father. When you see Jesus move in mercy, that's the Father. But wait a minute. How about Jesus turn, throw, turning over the the tables of the money lenders in the temple. He was angry. And this is the way I've come to see the Lord. I was meditating for a while in Lamentations, Jeremiah's uh, second book, Lamentations. The mercies, of the, the, the mercies of the Lord are new every morning. We are not destroyed. And, and because of that, we are not destroyed. So God is a loving God. God is a merciful God. God is a kind God. But there comes a point where he can't take it anymore. Can you see that? He, he's a loving God. He's a kind God. He's a merciful God. But man, man just pushes and pushes and pushes. And I mean, uh, I'm a long way from it in the annual Bible reading, but I never, I never cease to be amazed every year when I get to the conquest of Jerusalem. They get down to the very end and God speaks through the prophet 
and, and says to the king of Israel, if you'll just do this one thing, if you'll just free the slaves, then the city will not be overthrown. And then they turn the slaves loose, but then a day or two later, they change their mind, they gather them all back up, and the city falls. I mean, man, man, man is hardened in rebellion against God. And we don't want to be like that. Can I get an amen? We want to be, we want to be tender when we hear the word. We want to be responsive when we hear the word. Uh, we don't want to be hard-hearted and uh, sit in church and hear the word and get destroyed later. I don't want to be like that. I, I want God to be able to get a hold of my heart by the word. See, every lesson I learn from the word is a lesson I don't have to learn in the school of hard knocks. Any, anybody ever been in the school of hard knocks? I got my hand up. You know, anybody want to avoid the school of hard knocks in the future? I got my hand up. Amen. So Jesus was the will of the Father revealed. And as you study Jesus, you will know the Father's will. Jesus' death and substitutionary sacrifice were the will of the Father. Jesus was the will of God unveiled. But now, here's something else we need to think about, mull over, meditate on, and that is we are the Father's will. We are the Father's will. Jesus came to do the Father's will. Jesus was the Father's will. And of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, James 1.8. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. You know, Billy Graham made it famous, but he didn't coin the term born again. We are born from above. We are born again. We are born of God. We are the will of God. Paul talks about uh, children born of the Father's will. Uh, we're not a chance. We're not a happenstance. We're not a circumstance. We have been born of the Father's will. We are the will of God. Shout it out loud. I am the Father's will. Say it again, I am the Father's will. I am the Father's will. Amen. Uh, we need to say it until our ears become accustomed to it, until our spirit absorbs it. I am my Father's will. It is easy for me to do His will, for I am born of it. I have His nature in me. I have the impulses of His own love heart throbbing through me. You know, we need to confess that we have the love... that. We have the nature of God in us. See, this is, this, this is high concept stuff, but it's, it's important. Uh, I have his nature in me. We, we don't really believe this. You know, uh, we, I, think, I think we still picture this, you know, God on one side and the devil on the other, and there's this cosmic wrestling match going on. No, 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 no. Satan is defeated. He is eternally defeated. Christ Jesus made an open show and spectacle of Satan on Calvary's cross. So his gift is deception. And that's what we're going to be dealing with in that power lunch, mind games. Because he wants to do what he did to Adam and Eve, and that is talk them right out of that garden. I mean, we can be in a great place, and his gift is deception. And he'll talk us right out of it. Can you see that? So the more, the more word of God we absorb, the more will of God that we know and are able to walk in. The more word of God that we absorb, the more will of God that we know and that we're able to walk in. Let me just throw, throw one out there. Ephesians 3.20. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. But look at the language. According to his power, that is at work where? At some convention somewhere? According to his power, that is at work where? Within us. All right. So, and in this series previously, we've, we've talked about how that we have been made new creations in Christ. Uh, in the 2018 Holy Week Revival Mountain Moving Faith, we talked about how God has given every believer a measure of faith. So what are we really talking about? We talk, we're talking tonight about being born from above, that we are the Father's will. Well, how are, we born from, how are we born from above? How are we born again? 
Well, the spirit man. We dealt with this last Wednesday. Not the flesh, not my body, not my mind, not my will, not my emotions. The spirit man within me was recreated, what? In Christ Jesus. And so when that happens, we, we, we have this power at work within us. So the power of God, think about it. It, it, it took more power to raise Jesus from the dead than it did to create all these planets and all these stars because there was no opposition back when he created the planets and the stars. But when, he w but when it was time to raise Jesus from the dead, you had Satan and one third of the angels all arrayed against that. Uh, but that power is in us. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead. And then the love nature of God. You know, I had to I had to work on it through confession. You know that I had the I had the love nature of God. Now that doesn't mean we let people use us and abuse us and walk all over us, but I mean I can be kind while I'm saying no. Can you understand that? And uh, and I can give them a copy of God's very own child when I say no. You know, we had to leave the gates open for a few days a while back because the package is coming and people knock on the door. I'm not used to people knocking on my door. You know, it, it, I just had to smile and be kind and be friendly and say no. So, but we have the love nature of God on the inside of us. Amen. But wait a minute, we have the faith nature of God on the inside of us. The same power that spoke all those planets into existence, the same power that spoke all those stars into existence, some of that resides inside of us if we're born again. Amen. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead, some of that's inside of us. Amen. And faith, we know from Hebrews 12 that the, the universe that was created, these planets, these stars, it was all created by God speaking. Genesis 1, Hebrews 12, by God speaking. And so that a piece of that faith is on the inside of us. I realize these are kind of high concepts and it can be hard to get our mind around. That's why we have to meditate on the word of God. See, Father God, Genesis 1, Hebrews 12, Father God had a speaking faith. And aren't the children supposed to be like the father? You know, if, assuming you had a good father. Well, we have a good father, right? Yeah. So our father, his nature is love. Our father, his nature is mercy. Our father, his nature is faith. Our father, his nature is... The nature of his faith is a speaking faith. He spoke and the worlds came into existence. And you see it over and over and over and over and over, not just in the four Gospels through Jesus, but you see it over and over and over in the book of Acts. Peter, Peter and John said to the, man, the crippled man at the gate called Beautiful, uh, silver or gold have we none, but that which we have, that which we have, that which we have, we give you. That which we have, what did they have? What did they have? Well, they had, they had exactly what you and I have. They had, they had some God on the inside. See, but as long as Satan's got us messed up thinking about the next car payment, thinking about the next rent payment, thinking about, you know, the hangnail, thinking about these battles in our body, well, we're not really thinking big picture. And he, and he runs us and he rules us with these issues. And that's why I'm taking my time in this study course on faith and prayer. And that's why we're doing a Holy Week revival on seven steps, seven steps to answer prayer. I want you, good people, to get your prayers answered. Because the sooner we get our prayers answered, the sooner we can go on to the business of the kingdom. Can you see that? And not be, not be thinking about the same old stuff every morning. I, I don't know about you, but I, I at least like new things to pray about. I'm not really a big fan of having to cover the same territory. Amen? Amen. So he is love. I'm born of love. I have his love nature in me. That nature rules me. His love is shed abroad by the Holy Spirit of God in my heart. It dominates me. I love because he first loved me. 
And, uh, you know, when I was a younger man, I had, to, I had to work on this. But as the years have gone by, it's gotten easier. It really has. Hallelujah. Because I've come to see that none of it affects me anyway. About a dozen years back, there was a man came up and uh, met me at the back door here or at the, the door going out from the fellowship atrium. And he had really done us wrong. And he had, he had stolen $50,000 from a man in the church. I mean, he had, he had done some nefarious stuff. Bank, bankrupted his wife. I mean, he did some nefarious stuff. And he, he, he stopped. Only person in 40 years. He, he came and asked my forgiveness. And I said, I forgive you, brother. I said, I never thought, of, I never thought about it a, 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 a second time. Never thought about it. But I forgive you. But you see, you know why it's gotten easier for me over the years? I see it doesn't affect me. See, but when you hold bitterness and unforgiveness in your heart, that doesn't affect the other person, but that does affect you. And uh, we, we dealt with last Wednesday night, if God be for us, who can be against us? Kenneth Hagin, the one that went to be with the Lord in 2003, said, he liked to say it this way, if God be for us, what, is it, what difference does it make who's against us? So people can do all this stuff they're doing, but I've come to see over the years, it doesn't affect me anyway. Not unless I believe it does and confess it does. But it, so long as I don't believe it does and confess it does, it doesn't affect me anyway. Right. Amen? Amen? I'm immune from it. Right. So it's easy to forgive. It's easy to let it go. They're not messing me up. They're messing them up. Can you see that? But now, I didn't offer to give them my checkbook. Here, you hold my checkbook. You understand? <laughs> hey, you know, just because we're saved doesn't mean we, we, we lost our brains. Amen? So we can forgive and, uh, and let it go. But that doesn't mean we're signing up for another beating. People seem to have trouble with this. I don't. You know, I forgive it, let it go, but I'm not signing up for another beating. You know, I've been through it. No, uh, you know, God bless. Amen. Now, some things are tougher. You know, relatives. Oh, and, uh, but I've lived long enough that everybody that caused me trouble is dead. So it's easier now. Amen. They're all gone. Praise his holy name. Amen. They're all gone. Everybody that tormented me is gone. Amen. But we have to walk in love. It's not a recommendation. But love... Listen, love begins, I mean, if you, uh, love begins, in my estimation, with children. And that's why I just don't believe we have that much more time left because what they're doing, they're doing to children. And it's horrific. And uh, so children are to be protected. And that's the main thing here at Faith Christian Center. I get tested on it. I'm shocked I get tested on it. But I get tested on it periodically. But we always protect the children. And I figure if it costs me numbers, if it costs me money, God will make it up to me. But I, I, my job, first off, to walk in love, I've got to protect the children. So the children come first. Amen. And then in my life, what I saw, <laughs> well, I'll tell you the story. It's, uh, it's kind of, Different, but uh, you know, I'm standing there in October of 1993, and and my dad died at age uh, 62, and he's laying there in the box, and uh, I had a vision, I saw it. In fact, I remember telling telling Sue that that I, my job from that point forward, I said I'm going to live my life in such a way to where when I'm in the box. Austin and Christina are going to look at each other and say, well, what are we going to do now? In other words, to be such an awesome blessing. Can you see that? But I did not know. I did not know. Get ready for a, for a high concept to go right across your bow. I did not know that uh, that would accelerate God blessing me financially. I didn't know that, but I see it clearly now. 
Oh, the reason is because we we're standing there at the box, and I don't know why, but we're reminiscing. We bought our first house. Actually, it was it was worse than that. When when we got married, you could have bought a custom home in Southwest Arlington for forty thousand dollars, and uh, then a year or two later, it was two years later, we bought we bought a lesser type house in East Fort Worth. It cost forty thousand dollars. And in those days, if my dad had coughed up $20,000 and if Sue's dad had coughed up $20,000, they would never have missed the money. They would never have missed the money. But here's the point. Our lives would have been entirely different. And so I had a vision. I had a vision to be a blessing. I don't know what you think of me. It doesn't much matter. But I'm being a blessing right now. Because I don't need I don't need to be here. I could I I have enough. I could check into a beach Ritz Carlton and spend the rest of my days there, and I would not run out. Yeah, I Sue might run out, but I would not run out. Because <laughs> you know women live longer than men. Amen. So, but my point is, see, I'm, I'm I'm my job is to be a blessing. What is that? That's God on the inside of me. I'm not, I'm not saying anything that is a lot to, 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 I'm not trying to brag. I'm saying this is God in us, to be a blessing, not to hang on, not to deny, not to, uh, uh, how about this, covet? No, no, we, we ought to have the, the in, down in here, not, not our mind, not our emotions, not our flesh, but on this, this born-again man on the inside is God in us. Now, we don't have it in the same measure, of course, as Jesus, but it is the same thing because it's God in us. Now, to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine, according to his power over at the special meeting down at the convention center in some other town or village? No, according to his power that is at work where? Within us. And this is why, this is why needy people can never be satisfied because they're looking for their answers in that guy or that gal or over here or over there and, and it's a black hole down through the middle of them and it'll never be filled. But when you, get, when, you get, when you get Jesus on the inside of you and you walk in it, now you can get Jesus on the inside of you and still live a carnal life. That's not going to do anybody any good. You might make heaven, but you're going to live a lousy life here. But when you get Jesus down on the inside of you and you walk like it, you don't have that big old hole down through the middle of you anymore. Amen. And then you're not looking to people to meet your needs because you've got God on the inside. Can you see that? You've got God on the inside. And we look to him. It's the secret to everything. We look to him. We look to him. You've never met a pastor like me, and you, you probably will never meet another one like me. See, I look to God. I don't look to man. People come, people go. My friend, J. Don George, he's gone on to be with the Lord now. He used to say, you know, people come, people go. The trick is to have more people coming than going. So, uh, but, but we look to the Lord. And so when I stand up and I minister the word of God, I'm not thinking about the attendance. Maybe I should, but I'm not. I'm not thinking about the offering. Maybe I should, but I'm not. The Lord just covers it. Amen. You know, the money comes. It all gets covered. Amen? Amen? So the Lord is my source. The Lord is my source. The Lord is my source. But he's, he's not... He's not over there somewhere. He's not at a special meeting. He's not at a convention. I don't have to get on an airplane to go somewhere. He's right here. He's right here. Amen. So I've come to believe in his love for my, in my case, I believe that his love way is the best way. I mean, what is heaven? What is heaven? Heaven is where nobody's trying to harm anybody. Heaven is where nobody's trying to kill anybody. Heaven is where nobody's trying to take advantage of anybody. So when Jesus said that he was the way, the truth, and the life, that was the love way and the love, that love is the reality of that way. It can be a challenge. I'm not saying it's not a challenge. I'm just saying that's the way it is. 
He only gave us one command in the New Testament to love one another. You know, you get in John's gospel toward the end before the arrest, and this is what's on his mind, that they love one another. I mean, there were 12 of them, 11 at that point, and uh, it was on his mind that they love one another because we're human beings. You know, we have differences, but that we walk in love, that we're kind toward one another, that we're considerate toward one another, that we don't try and rip each other. I don't think there's anything that irritates me as much as somebody in the church trying to rip off brothers in the church. You know, number one, you ought not be doing that to people in the world. You're going to give Christ a bad reputation. But to do that in the church, you know, it shouldn't be. So we have, the, we have the life of God on the inside of us. We have the life of the Father on the inside of us. We have the life of the Son on the inside of us. We have the life of the Spirit on the inside of us. We are born of the Father's will. And we, are, we have His nature in us. See, see when, you, when you got saved, you got born again. So you have a new nature. And uh, it's a cop-out to say, well, I'm like this because that's the way I was raised. You're copping out. I I'm like this because that's the way my dad was. You're copping out. I'm this way because that's the way my mom was. You're copping out. You, you have been born again. You got a reset. You have, you have a new nature on the inside of you. So we ought to act like it. We ought to walk like it. We ought to talk like it. I've been, I've been doing this a while. Uh, well, you know, I have regrets. There was a nice young man in the church years ago, and uh, he was dating this gal, and she seemed like, you know, she seemed like, you know, she was a good catch. And lifelong full gospel gal seemed like a, seemed like a good catch. But I, I was standing right out there, and her parents came to visit. This was before they got married. And uh, when, when I met her mama, I'd met her mama before. I mean, I, I mean it's, it's, like a, it's like a repeat of a repeat of a repeat. And I'd, I'd met that woman before. You know, lifelong Pentecostal as mean as a timber rattler. You know, judgmental, hair pulled in a bun, no makeup. I thought, I, I, I've, I've met you before. And it's a regret that I didn't tell that young man, run for your life. Because uh, this is going to be a repeat. But I didn't say anything. It's none of my business. Amen. Huh. Dear Lord, maybe I should have. Maybe, when I, maybe now that I got some gray on me, I'll speak up. <laughs> I don't know. But my point is, my point is, I've met this, I've, and it doesn't have to be a woman, could be a man, but I've met this over and over and over and over. See, that they sit in church, there's something wrong. When people sit in church and the love nature of God never manifests. There's something wrong when people sit in church and the love nature of God never manifests. And I'm not sure why that is. It's willful though, I know that. You know, I listened to Kenneth Hagin a lot, the one that went to be with the Lord in 2003, and he tells the same story over and over and over in different ways because he, he's recollecting different meetings back in the 30s and the 40s especially. And you understand that when he started out, it wasn't huge. He was what uh, T.L. condescendingly called a, a church preacher. And so he was in these churches doing these meetings, and he tells the same story over and over and over, but it's not the same story. There's dozens of these stories because he'd be doing a meeting in a, in a full gospel church and he would inevitably, because of word of mouth, he would have Southern Baptists come in and Methodists come in and because they heard about the healings and, and they would get healed. And then full gospel people would get mad about it. Well, how come God healed so-and-so? You know, she's a Methodist and, and, and I've been here 30 years and God hasn't healed me. And, and then one story he said, the woman said to Kenneth Hagin, and she was wearing makeup. See, in other words, in other words, it's, this, it's just this crazy mindset. It doesn't matter if you had sought healing for how many years. What kind of person is not happy about somebody else over here getting healed? Can you see that? In other words, they, they spend all that time in church, but the love nature of God 
never manifested itself in their heart. And I say to you that something's wrong. If, If you can't, if you can't, I remember there's a guy sitting here tonight he pulled up in an S600 one Sunday, said, Pastor, come look at, look at the car I got. I went out there and I looked at that. I, I told, I, I'm walking back in the church. I said, Father, he passed me. That can't stand. So I went and bought one that week. And, you know, but I got different wheels. So everybody knew I wasn't trying. And I, I didn't want his. I went and got my own. But I mean, and, and you have no idea how blessed you are to be in a place where, you know, if somebody gets a better job or they get a bonus or they get a car or they get a wife or they, you know, I'm, we're happy for you. Sue and I and Austin and Jessica, we're happy for you. We're, we're, man, I, I don't understand these people that aren't happy for their brothers and their sisters being blessed by the Lord. I don't understand that. Because the, the nature of God in us would rejoice for a brother or a sister uh, getting a house or getting a better job or uh, you know, I sat right here in my own church. And Austin read that testimony. And I got to admit, man, because, you know, I've been, I've been full gospel since 1960. I've been, I, I, have been, I have been in full gospel churches longer than most of y'all been on the planet. And I got to admit, man, it hit me just a little bit sideways. And then I, but about two seconds later, I had the joy of the Lord. You know, when Austin read that testimony about a guy in his church, he was in the hospital and found out his wife was sleeping around on him. And, uh, you know, but praise God. God met his, answered his prayer and, and God gave him a better wife. You know, and when, when Austin stood up here and said that, I got to admit, you know, because I'm a lifelong full gospel person, I thought, it just hit me a little sideways. But about two seconds later, I thought, well, praise God. <laughs> praise God. Because there's got to be something better than being laid up in the hospital and your wife shagging, you know, (laughs) whatever. You know, there's got to be something better than that. So praise God. You understand? So, you know, we, we need to be happy. When God answers somebody's prayer, we need to be happy. When God heals somebody, don't, don't say, well, why didn't God heal me? Don't, don't, no, no, no. Amen. He tells one story where somebody did, said that about somebody else came in the church and got healed, and, and he was back at that same church years later, years later, five years later, six, seven years later, and that same woman in every healing line and never got a thing. You cannot get ahead. Not having the love of God in your heart. You can't do it. You're not going to have your prayers answered. We need to be happy and rejoice. When God heals somebody, when God blesses somebody, when, uh, when, uh, when God answers somebody's prayer, amen? Because God rejoices and be happy. I'm gonna, let's get down to one, one uh, more scripture and we'll quit tonight. So, We are partakers of the divine nature. Lift both hands up and say, thank you, Father God. God. We are partakers partakers of the divine nature. nature. So we have the Father's word now as it fell from the lips of Jesus. See, they didn't have that for a long time, but we've got it in these Bibles. We can live the Father's word. The Father's word is his will, so we can live in his will. Let me give you two scriptures. We'll quit. A verse that has been a great help to me is Psalm 138, 2. I will bow down toward your holy temple and will praise your name for your love and your faithfulness, for you have exalted above all things your name and your word. Say it out loud. Lift your hands and look to heaven and say, you have exalted above all things your name and your word. All right, so that means his word is above everything. His word is above tumors. His word is above growths. His word is above cysts. His word is above cancers. His word is above arthritis. His word is above it all. His word is above it all. You have exalted above all things your name and your word. One of his names is Jehovah Rapha. Another name is Jehovah Jireh. He has exalted above all things his name and his word. See, so never think, well, this is too big. No, it's not too big. Nothing is too hard for the Lord. Nothing is nothing is too difficult for the Lord. And then Proverbs 4, 20, 20, 20 to 22. And I like the King James here. My son, attend to my words. You could, you could bump into somebody and uh, 
Let's say you're downtown, you park, you're downtown, you could run into a Faith Christian Center member, and they say, hey, how you doing? You want to, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm down here to have lunch. You want to step over here and have lunch? And you might say to them, no, there's something I have to attend to. In other words, maybe you have an appointment with a banker, something's going on, you guys, and you might say, I mean, you want to go have lunch, but you say, no, I have something I have to attend to. In other words, it implies priority. See, and the writer of Proverbs says, my son, attend to my words. In other words, give priority to his words. Now, I'm not saying that entertainment's bad. We should never do entertainment, but we should attend to God's words. We should give priority to God's words. Incline thine ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes. If you, want, if you listen to Sue's message, Crazy Faith, and I'm so sad that somebody at some point in time recycled that tape. We don't have the video. We just have the audio. But we do have my version of it and Austin's version of it. But if you go back and listen to Pastor Sue's message on crazy faith, she talks about how we did this, how we bought this land, how we built this building. And she talks about how the, we had crazy faith and we had post-its all over the house. We had post-its on the kitchen cabinets. We had post-its on the refrigerator. We had, I mean, you got to put post-its where you're going to see them. So you put them on the refrigerator and the pantry door. And we had post-its on the, on the mirror. And so we kept the Word of God in front of us. Somebody might say, well, that's fanaticism. Yeah, but we're sitting in it. And guess what? We ain't got no debt. Amen. So in other words, it worked to keep God's Word right in front of us. And sometimes... <laughs> it's not like brill cream, a little dab will do you. No, sometimes you got to get heavy duty into faith to move the mountain. Because some mountains have, you know, they, they don't want to move. My son, attend to my words, incline thine ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart. And this lines up with, I'm not going to use this scripture in the power lunch, but it lines up with the power lunch, Joshua 1.8. I've got to, it's, Joshua 1.8 is about the mind and the mouth and then doing. Doing is based on the mind and the mouth. I got to get the mind right. I got to get the mouth right. And then my actions have to follow. But he says, keep them in the midst of thine heart. So we ought not be meditating on failure. We ought not be meditating on fear. We ought not be meditating on doubt. We ought not be meditating on uh, unbelief. We ought not be meditating on frustration. And, and I'll tell you something else. We ought not be meditating on anger or how I'm going to get back at somebody and all of that stuff. Keep them. Keep what? The words of God in, thy, in the midst of thine heart. Why? 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 Verse 22, for they are life unto those that find them and health to all thy flesh. So I don't know about you. But if I need some life and I need some health to all my flesh, I've got to attend to his word and I've got to, I've got to keep his word. Uh, in, in, in the writings of Moses, they called them frontlets. I've got to keep his word right in front of my face so, so I will not depart from it. To the right or to the left, I've got to have his word down in my heart. Why? Why? Because it's life and because it is health to all my flesh.